All right, so today we are in week number three of our series in Jonah. Uh, if you'll remember from Mother's Day, I didn't preach anything special because it was Mother's Day, so dads, you get the same thing. We're just in Jonah <laughs> chapter three, Jonah week three, but I think we'll all learn something great from Jonah. Uh, let's do a quick recap of where we've been over the past few weeks. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah, and God tells Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. Jonah arose and said, no, God, I am not going to go. And he ran, ran to a place called Tarshish, about as far as you could possibly run in the opposite direction. And so to intercept Jonah, God in his mercy, God in his grace, sent a storm to the ship that Jonah is on. And the people on the ship, they figure out that Jonah is the cause for the storm and the problems that they're having. So Jonah gets thrown overboard. He hits the water, and God provides a big fish to swallow Jonah. And, and, and listen, we don't spend a lot of time talking about the big fish because, for me, I could spend 30 minutes trying to, trying to give you the apologetics for the big fish. But, but what, as, a, as a child, that wasn't even the hardest thing that was difficult for me to believe. As far as the story of Jonah, the hardest thing to believe wasn't just a big fish. Because even as a kid, I thought to myself, you know what? The, the crux of my faith is that this guy uh, predicted that he would be crucified. And then after he was dead, he came back to life after three days. And I believe that completely. And so there's a part of me that's like, if I can believe that, uh, the big fish is just not that. Everything else is just not that hard after that, right? So if you want to meet with me, let's get coffee. We'll talk about the big fish in detail. But we talked about this, that it seems that God in his word, in the book of Jonah, seems a lot more concerned about what is happening in the heart of Jonah than what is happening in the belly of the fish. And so that's what we're focused on. What's going on in the heart of Jonah and what can we learn from that? So we ended last week with this. Jonah, in the fish, he begins to pray. He begins to call on God. In his distress, he called on the Lord and the Lord heard him. So we ended in verse 9, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, says Jonah, will sacrifice to you. What I vowed, I will make good. He said, I've made some vow to God. I've made some promise to God. God has called me, and I'm going to make good on that promise. And Jonah says, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Anybody here hate the smell of vomit? Is there anybody in the room? Uh, this is, I mean, for Father's Day, here you go. Fathers, you know what vomit smells like, right? Uh, God in his grace brought me and Simi together, but it wasn't just his grace. I think God also has a sense of humor. And so uh, when, we are, when we are cleaning up our kids sick and their vomit and those things, the way God chose for it to be is that I'm in there and I'm cleaning and it's disgusting and whatever, but Simi has just the most sensitive gag reflex to the smell of vomit. So I'm cleaning. She's standing there. She's trying. I love her because she's trying, but she's like, bleh, 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 the whole time she's making that noise. And the reason God is funny is because after I got married and after we had kids, I discovered that gag noise to me is the funniest thing on earth. I never knew it. I never knew it, but we'd be in there and she's like, bleh, and I'm just like, ha. So we just look like crazy drunk people cleaning up vomit, right? It's, it's college all over again for us with our kids. But, but vomit is disgusting, can we just admit? Uh, and can you imagine the vomit of a fish? Can you imagine something that already kind of smells gross, the vomit that comes out of that fish? So here's Jonah. God answers his prayer, but he finds himself on shore in a pile of big fish vomit. Yeah, okay, that's what I need you to feel, right? I need you to feel that. Because the point is this, that, that the method of God's deliverance may be messy. May be messy. You may be going through something. Maybe you, in your life, have been running from God. And maybe God, in his grace and his mercy, has called you back towards him. And you have made a decision. You have made a choice. I know over the past two weeks, speaking to so many of you who have made a choice, you have confessed, I've been running, and I'm going to turn back to God. I've been running, and this is the opportunity for me to turn my life around. And I wish, 
I wish as a pastor that that was like, you just like sit here and you say a nice little prayer and then you walk out of the room and all your addictions have disappeared and all the things that you struggle with and the problems you're having in life and the ways that you have run from God, they just get cleaned up really easily. Like the, like the doors of this auditorium are some kind of portal, right? And you just walk out and magically everything's transformed. But I know that's not how it is. And Jonah, lying in big fish vomit, would tell you sometimes that's not how it goes. That you can turn your life around. That you can experience the deliverance of the Lord, but it's, it's messy sometimes. And it stinks sometimes. And sometimes you, will, you might have to go to counseling in order to get your life on track as you desire to do. You might have to find a therapist to do that. You might have to have some really hard accountability with other people. You might have to confess what's going on in your life. You might have to confess what you're struggling with. You might have to put that in front of other people, and it can be difficult. You might have to make some hard choices, some painful decisions. You might have to walk away from certain groups of friends because they keep pulling you toward Tarshish. Are you with me? I know there's someone in my family, and God miraculously delivered him from alcoholism. But in being delivered from alcoholism, it also meant he had to make a very conscious choice to leave behind a successful career. Because in his career, the people that he had to spend a lot of time with would, would just embrace this culture of alcohol. And he knew, if I'm going to be free from this addiction, I can't be in that place anymore. See, that's messy. That smells like vomit a little bit. And Jonah would tell you, it is hard. But that's how God often delivers people. Here's what Jonah wanted. Here's what we've seen over the past two weeks in Jonah. Jonah wants a God of his own making. A God who would simply smite the bad people, the Ninevites, and bless the good people, Jonah's countrymen. That's what he wants. But Jonah keeps interacting with the real God, not his counterfeit version, the real God. And every time he keeps meeting him, it fills him with fury and anger and confusion. That's the problem. So now Jonah comes out of this big fish and he realizes that in his pursuits in life, he has been running away from God. But he recognizes that God in his mercy has saved him and now God is going to call him to be a part of his saving work in the lives of others. And the prodigal prophet is now ready to go. So we get to Jonah chapter 3. And Jonah 3, one says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now, what's interesting is verbatim, that's the same thing we see in Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, right? We're right back where we started a couple weeks ago. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. The only difference is this is the second time. And, and, and I've got to tell you, if you've been wondering, maybe you walked into church for the first time today, maybe you've heard certain things about what it means to follow God or what it means to go to church. If you've ever wondered if God gives second chances, Jonah shows you that God is the God of second chances. He calls Jonah again. He brings him back on track in his mercy. He goes and he intervenes in Jonah's bad decisions and choices and brings him back into his presence. And now God comes to him again. God loves to rescue runners. God loves to rescue people who seem like they are far from him. Abraham gets a second chance. Jacob gets a second chance. David gets a second chance. Peter gets a second chance. The scriptures are filled with people who get second chances. And in the same way, God comes to Jonah again. But, but I want to say this. I want to say this. Because this is something that I have experienced in, in my own lifetime. We praise God for his grace. We praise God for his grace. And we praise God for second chances. We praise God for his grace. But we do not presume upon grace. We do not presume upon grace. And what I mean by that is this. God is a God of second chances. Absolutely 100% true. But tomorrow is not promised to us. Tomorrow is not promised to us. You look at Moses. In Numbers 20, Moses had second chances for sure. He killed a guy, right? And God calls him. God uses him. He has second chances. But in Numbers 20, Moses goes against the will of God, kind of like Jonah, refutes the leadership of God in his own life. In Numbers 20, Moses sins, and due to his sin, God says, you will not enter the promised land. 
So we praise God for his grace, but we don't presume upon his grace. He gives second chances, but tomorrow is not promised. You look at Herod Agrippa in Acts 12. We talked about him a couple weeks ago. The end of that chapter, Acts 12, Herod Agrippa, in his arrogance, tries to act like he is God. And he does not refute that. So he's like, I am God. And it's basically like in the middle of his sentence, the angel strikes him dead. So a second chance is available for someone like Herod Agrippa, but second chances run out at some point. Are you with me? And what I'm trying to say is this. Because of this this series that we've been in looking over the life of Jonah, because the way people have been praying for you, because the way God might be leading you in his mercy, his goodness, and his grace, maybe there's been something in you where you are like, I think God is trying to get a hold of me. I think God is trying to get my attention. I think God is calling me to do something difficult, to stop running from him and to run back to him. If he's getting your attention, don't wait to do what he's calling you to do. Don't just say, I'll do it one day, I'll get to it tomorrow. Surely I'll have a third, fourth, fifth chance. We praise God for his grace, but we don't presume upon his grace. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. So how can we live in it any longer? That's the place where Jonah gets to. He's like, I have been running, but I'm going to stop running. And that deliverance may be messy, that deliverance may be difficult, but it leads you into abundant, new, and flourishing life in Jesus. And so he knows, tomorrow's not promised. I got to listen. I got to obey today. And in verse 2, God says to Jonah, a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh. And proclaim to it the message I give you. Again, you're going to see there's so many parallels between the first two chapters of Jonah and the second two chapters of Jonah. And here again we see it's the exact same thing we saw in Jonah chapter 1 verse 2. Verbatim, go to the city of Nineveh. The directive has changed a little bit. It's not go there and speak against their evil because their wickedness has come before me. Now he says go and proclaim the message that I give you. And what do we learn from this verse right here? It's so important. It is that just because I throw a toddler hissy fit and try to run from God, it does not mean that he's going to change his mind. God tells him to do, all right, Jonah, you ready? You back? You want to get up out of the vomit? Go do what I told you to do in the first place. It's not like this is how I am with my kids, right? I just, I just give in too easily. I'm a wuss, right? And so they cry. They throw a fit. I'm like, okay, fine. You don't have to do that. Go ask your mom what to do because I don't know anymore. Like, I'm out of, you know, so that's, that's what I do. That's not what God does. God is like, I told you to go to Nineveh. Now that you're done with your little hissy fit, go to Nineveh. Do what I have called you to do. God says, I called you to run with me and you ran from me. And so now I am calling you back to be a part of my great purpose in this world and in what I am doing. So verse three, Jonah obeyed. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Now there's a lot of stuff going on here. We'll get to Jonah obeyed in a second. But I want to focus on where it says Nineveh was a very large city because it said it in in the one right before it. Go to the great city of Nineveh. And here it says, again, very large city. In the NIV, the way they've translated it seems to talk about the size, the scope, the power, the influence of Nineveh. But in the original text, it's it's really translated from a different standpoint. In the original text, it gives the idea that it is an exceedingly great city. And what it means is Nineveh is important. Nineveh is a place of great significance. Nineveh is valuable because that place belongs to God. Like in the original text, that's how it is written. It's not just Jonah go there because there's important people there, and it's a place of influence, and it's a place of power. It's Jonah go to that city because that city matters to God, and it matters to God because that city belongs to God. Are you with me? God tells Jonah, and it doesn't belong to the Assyrians, it doesn't belong to their armies, it doesn't belong to their wealth, it doesn't belong to their influence, that city belongs to me, and I want you to go there. And likewise, you and I, all of us, 
have been called to live in cities and work in cities and towns and neighborhoods, whatever you want to call it. But those places belong to God. Norman belongs to God. Noble belongs to God. Oklahoma City. Edmond belongs to God. Newcastle. Blanchard belongs to God. Choctaw belongs to God. Did I cover all of you? Lexington belongs to God, right? Like every place that your footsteps, every place that God sends you, it belongs to him. It matters to him. It's valuable to him. And he tells you to go to those places and one by one, by his grace and by his power working in you, redeem those places for the one who they belong to in the first place. Jonah obeyed and God says, go to that place. It belongs to me. Those people belong to me and I want to know them. I want to work in their life. Jonah obeys. Big difference between Jonah 1 and Jonah 3, right? This time God calls him and he obeys quickly. What's changed in the life of Jonah? How does Jonah have, uh, how does God have Jonah's unreserved yes? Whatever you say, God, I'll do it. Two things have changed. Because the person who has your unreserved yes is first your authority and second, it is your love. And now God is Jonah's authority. Before God was not his authority. I remember when I was a youth pastor, we had a, a large youth ministry in Northwest Oklahoma City. And so hundreds of kids would come, but a lot of them did not go to our church. They would just come from everywhere. So we didn't know who everybody was. And, and one day, uh, we have a large team of youth leaders, but we also had a large team of police officers. That's the kind of youth group I led, right? And so one day, one of the officers came to me, and they're like, well, you know, Jason, we think like some, a lot of alcohol has kind of infiltrated the group. We don't know where it came from, but it's kind of, we're finding it in pockets everywhere today. And I was like, great, I'm going to lose my job. I'm not too far into this, so that's awesome. Uh, but they, they have an idea of who it belongs to. They're like, we believe it's this kid right here. And this is not one of the kids that just came in. This is like one of our church kids. I know this kid, and I know his family. So I go to him, and I'm like, hey, man, um, I need to look in your car. Because we think that you are, like, bringing alcohol in, and it's kind of messed up. I need to look in your car. And he just, like, dressed me down there in front of everybody. Who are you? You just work at the church. You're nobody. I'm not going to listen to you. You can't look in my car. And I was like, okay. So I asked the police officers, like, can y'all look in his car? And they're like, I mean, you know, there are laws. We can't just like go, just because you say so, we can't go look in his car. And I'm like, dang it, laws, right? So what do we do? <laughs> and they tell me, if you give us a little bit of time, if you give us a little bit of time, we can make it happen. And I was like, I don't have time, right? We're only here for an hour. And so I knew what to do. I know this kid's dad. And I think to myself, I was like, you want to come after me? You don't have any money. That's not your car. That's your dad's car, right? So I call his dad. Dad comes down, and Dad's like, yeah, open the car. Like, let him look in the car, man. And sure enough, his car is, like, full of beer. It's exactly what we thought. And I just saw his dad go at him. And all of a sudden, this defiant kid is very much like, yes, sir, no, sir, I'm sorry, sir, snot, tears. I'm just standing there like, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Bless his holy name, yeah. And, and, and you quickly learned who his authority was. Are you with me? And everything changed when his authority came into the room. God will have your unreserved yes when he is your authority. The other one who has your unreserved yes is always going to be your love. Your love. Uh, one of my closest friends in high school was a guy named Joel. I grew up with him. We knew each other since like preschool. And I remember one day at Mustang High School, I'm standing there. I see Joel like I see him every day. But this day he walked by and I was like... I was like, bro, you smell amazing, right? What is going on? What is that? He said, aqua de joe. If you're like my age, you know what aqua de joe is. And, and he says, it's aqua de joe. Isn't it great? And that's the day I learned that Joel had a girlfriend because all of a sudden he smelled different. <laughs> he looked different. Everything had changed with him because your love also has your unreserved yes. He had seen God's authority at work. Jonah has. He's seen God as authority over the waves and the sea. He is the authority over the fish. He's the authority over boats. God is in control of everything. For sure, Jonah has seen God's authority on display. But he's also seen God come chase after him while he runs away. He's also seen the mercy of God at work in incredible ways, bringing him back to God's presence, bringing him back. And so he's seen God's love at work. And the only way that we will overcome the resistance in our heart 
to God is when we learn to respect his authority and to rest in his love. Respect his authority and rest in his love. That's the only time that God will have our unreserved yes. We read it in Psalm 119, 67. The psalmist says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Before I was afflicted, I did my own thing. I did whatever I wanted. I ran in freedom. But now I obey your word. Jonah has been afflicted. He has experienced the authority of God, but he's also learned to rest in the love of God in the midst of his affliction, and it leads him to obey. Again, parents, you know this. Your kids, as they get older and as they start to walk and as they start to run, there's that moment where they're just like, you know what? I'm sick of these people, my mom and dad. And they, and they run away. They love freedom, right? And they run away. And moms are like, don't let them go too far. What if something happens? What if it's dangerous? What if they don't come back, right? And, and this is on Father's Day. The role of the father is just to be like, let him go. Let him go. We don't want him to live with us when he's 40, right? Let him go. He'll figure it out. And then your kid gets far enough away where, like, for the first time, they don't see you, right? And they're just like terrified. What do I do? I don't like freedom. I want mommy and daddy, right? Like that's what I want. And, and that's kind of what's happened to Jonah and it's what happens in many of our lives. In, in, in the desire for freedom, in the desire to be God over our own life, we run. And as we run further and further, we realize that God as our authority and God as our love is a good thing. And it brings us back to him. That's what he has witnessed. That's what he has experienced. And so now when the word of God comes to him again, he obeys. Go to the exceedingly great city of Nineveh. Nineveh was an impressive place. The capital city of Assyria, one of the most powerful regimes at that time. They had impressive buildings, libraries, monuments, uh, public buildings. It, It was meant to intimidate its enemies. It would have been an impressive place. But it was also a place of utter brutality and violence. There's a podcast I love. Uh, Steve Sneed, who was playing piano, actually turned me on to it. Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. I don't know if any of you are friends of Dan, uh, not friends, fans of Dan Carlin. Uh, but he, he talks about the Assyrian Empire. He talks about Nineveh. And what he said is, it is the cruelest, vilest, most powerful, most idolatrous empire that there ever was. So good news, Jonah, that's where you go. Uh, We actually have words from one of the kings of Assyria, ruler over Nineveh near that time. His name is Ashurnazirpal II, in case you're thinking it's the first. It's the second. And and this is what he looks like. I got a picture of him. Yeah, great, the self-portrait of him. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. But I'm going to read you something from one of his journals, some of his writings. I know you can't really tell what he looks like. I know, I know. You can't tell what he looks like, but that's the best I could do. But I want you to read, I want you to read what he writes about his enemies after one of their battles. I stormed the mountain peaks and I took them. In the midst of the mighty mountains, I slaughtered them. With their blood, I dyed the mountain red like wool. The heads of their warriors I cut off and formed as a pillar against their city and their young men and their maidens I burned in the fire." He said again of their leader, I filleted him and spread his skin on the wall. So not a, you know, not a great place, a little dark, and, and God comes to Jonah and says, like I said, go there, right? What are you running for? Like, why did you say no? That's where you're supposed to go. A place of, of brutal violence, a dangerous place. Not just dangerous, but a very arrogant place, too. We have writings from another one of their kings, Asher Shinan. And, and can you believe or imagine being an archaeologist who uncovers these ancient documents? We have the writings of a king from 800 B.C. Like, isn't that amazing? He probably has the wisdom of the ages. He probably says incredible, profound, poetic things. Let's read what he says. I am powerful. I am all-powerful. I am a hero. I'm gigantic, I'm colossal, I'm honored, I'm magnified, I'm without equal, I'm so big, I'm the chosen one. It goes on and on, but you get the picture, right? Like, that's his attitude. So it's a place of violence, but a place of arrogance. 
They are violent. They are arrogant. It seems like everything is wrong with them. There's the kind of people you love to hate. And that's exactly where God sends Jonah. Because God loves to rescue people who run away from him. And God loves to rescue people who seem like they are beyond his grace. And God loves to rescue people who seem like they are not good enough to be in the family of God. It's the exact people that God loves to save. He loves the lost. His heart breaks for the broken. And he seeks out the shameful. And who is God sending you to? That's the question today for us to wrestle with in Jonah 3. It might be the neighbor who is nothing like you. Imagine walking into a city like Nineveh knowing that this is their reputation and God says, I want you to go there and tell them whatever I tell you to say. It might be the person who has very different political beliefs than you and you are like, I don't even want to have a conversation. I don't even want to look at this person. That might be who God is sending you to. It might be a member of your family who's very different than you. It might be someone you work with and you know their life is so out of line with Christ and his teaching and what it would mean to follow him. That might be who God is sending you to. But you cannot write anyone off because God loves to rescue messed up people. God loves to rescue people who are far from him. He wants them to experience his mercy and his grace. Uh, a few weeks ago, I met a friend. Uh, it was the first time we met. We've known each other over social media for a while. Uh, he grew up in India and had recently moved here. And, and I knew, I mean, he went to Bible school. I knew he's on fire for Jesus. He's living for Christ. And so I want to know his story. And so I asked him, tell me a little bit about how you came to faith. Tell me about your journey to Christ. And I kid you not, the first like three sentences in his faith story, Jason I hated Christians, I hated Jesus, and I wanted to see them all die. I'm like, that's not, not what I expected, all right? Like that's, that's not how I thought this conversation would go. But he was literally a part of, of a group of like Hindu radicals, and their job was to make sure they could get all of any other religion out of India, including Christianity. He hated Christians. So that obviously brings about some follow-up questions from me. I hated Christians. I hated Jesus. I want to see them die. All right, tell me more. Tell me more. And he told me the story of this family that moved into this, this group of homes where he lived. And he told me the story about a lady in one of those homes and how she would constantly invite him to her house. And, and he would, she would serve him tea. She'd have conversations. She'd ask questions. And after they became friends, after she asked a lot of questions, she started to share the gospel with him. And as she continued to share the gospel with him, his heart was softened, and then she started to invite him to her church. And God radically transformed his life. And today, he, he literally goes around the world and shares his story, which begins with, I hated Christians, I hated Christ, and I wanted to see them all die. But God has radically transformed his life over cups of tea, over cups of tea. There is no one who is beyond the reach of God's grace. There is no one that is too far gone. There is no one who has run so far that God cannot rescue them and bring them home. And so, in verse 4, Jonah begins by going a day's journey into the city. And can you imagine what he is feeling? If this is a place where they paint the walls with the blood of their enemies, if this is a place of such arrogance and pride, can you imagine what he's thinking as he walks through this intimidating city? The outer wall of Nineveh was about 100 feet high, is what archaeologists believe. It's intimidating. It's scary. And he's got to be terrified. And this is the message that God gave him to proclaim. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. It's eight words. That's the sermon. It's eight words. In Hebrew, it's actually just five words. It's even shorter. Now, we believe this is probably a summary of everything that he said. I throw that in there because I know some of you are going to be like, Jason, why can't you preach in eight words? Why can't you preach in five words, right? It's probably just a summary. And, and it's intentionally written this way in the scripture so that we see it is not Jonah's magnificent oratory that turns people to God. It is the power of God at work in and through Jonah. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And you might think, where's, where's the compassion in that? 
Like, why would he go and, and, and say such an uncompassionate message to the people of Nineveh? And we have to remember, as we look through the scriptures, whenever God pronounces his judgment ahead of time, it is because it's the last thing that he wants to do. Right? So for you Oklahomans in the middle of summer, when a mosquito lands on your arm, like you're not like, hey, little guy, I don't really like you sucking my blood, and I don't like the way like, you know, my whole body gets inflamed after you leave, and I get all itchy, and I, hey, little guy, that's not what you do. You smack that thing, right? And you're like, you touch me, you die, mosquito. Like That's how it goes. So when God pronounces his judgment ahead of time, it is because the last thing that he wants to do is give judgment to the people. Look at Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. This is kind of where we see this. God says, say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. That's what God desires. That's what God has called you to. That's why God calls you to do hard things and go to hard places. That's why deliverance is messy because God desires for everyone to turn to him and experience eternal, flourishing, abundant, and fruitful life. So Jonah goes in and says these eight words, 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And we wait with bated breath to see what happens in verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. The Ninevites believed God. And for someone like Jonah who hates these people so much, you got to see how big of a deal that is because it's the same verbiage that is used talking about Abraham, the father of their faith, the father of our faith. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. The Ninevites, these people Jonah despises, they believed God. A fast was proclaimed. All of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Sackcloth is this, it's uncomfortable, and, and you put it on as an outward symbol of humility and discomfort, this outward symbol that you're going to humble yourself and let God work in your life. And that's what they do, from the greatest to the least, because no one is exempt from what God was going to do. Doesn't matter if you have a lot of money, it doesn't matter if you are educated, it doesn't matter how comfortable your life was, God's message was for every person. Later on in this chapter, you're gonna see even the king of Nineveh has put on sackcloth and believes in God. And isn't that the great irony of this chapter of Jonah? The prophet of God needs a storm and a big fish and a captain, and he needs all this stuff to believe and obey God. And these people of Nineveh who we feel like they are so far gone and they are so terrible, they needed eight words, five words in Hebrew, and they believe God. Sometimes those who are farthest from God are the most ready to respond to his message of grace and salvation. And sometimes it's people in the church who feel like they know God so well who most need a transforming interaction with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't miss that. So when I said the fish wasn't the biggest problem I had with this passage as a kid, this was the biggest problem I had. For me, this was like the hardest part for me to believe. I'm a pastor now. I deal with human beings. And the thought that you can say eight words and get a whole city to turn to God and repent and believe God, I was like, no way. It's impossible, right? This person's never dealt with people. They don't know how human beings work. But that's what happens in this moment. And there are some contributing factors that you cannot forget, right? Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we've got to remember. History shows us this. I don't have too much time to dive into it. But again, Meet me for coffee. I'd love to tell you about how this goes. There are two plagues that have hit the city of Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire not long before Jonah shows up. And, and scientists can actually show you that there was also a total eclipse of the sun that it also happened not long before Jonah shows up. Now, today we can explain it. We can predict it. You went and you bought sunglasses so you can stand outside and watch it. Like That's the world we live in today. But in Jonah's world... The people of Nineveh and the people of Assyria are thinking, we must not be right with God. We don't know what it is, but we must not be right with God. Then this guy shows up and says, I have a message from God. You're not right with God. <laughs> That's why the whole city turns immediately and believes the message. You never know. You never know what is going on in people's lives, what's going on in people's hearts. 
Uh, it was late last year. I was speaking at a local uh, college at their chapel service. And I've spoken there several times, so I'm kind of used to how it usually goes. And this time I'm sitting where I'm usually sitting when I speak there. But for some reason, this particular time, I was surrounded by giants. I just felt like a baby, a little boy in the middle of college, giants all around me. And I'm like, this is weird, but whatever. The message God's put on my heart that day is this message about loving your enemies, turning the other cheek, praying for those who persecute you, And I'm like, thank you, Lord. That seems like a safe one. Everything's going to go great. Let's do it, right? And so I get up, and I preach that message. And and as we get to the end, I'm just noticing that that people in the room are visibly uncomfortable, right? Some people are looking at me like they are mad, and then others are are just, like, weeping, right? And it makes me upset because I'm like, this isn't even my best stuff, guys. I got way better stuff than this. Just love your enemy. This is easy stuff, right? Easy stuff. Jesus says this all the time. What's the big deal? And I give an altar call at the end. And these students, like they have never responded to any of my better stuff. Like they have never responded. They come forward and they're crying and they're praying and they're repenting. I'm just like, what is going on today? Like what is happening? And when I'm done, the president of the school came up to me and he's like, how do you know? You must have read it in the Daily Oklahoman. And I was like, bro, I don't read the Daily Oklahoman. Like, I don't, who reads the Daily Oklahoman? I don't even know. I was like, what's happening here? And he's like, uh, two days before I had gotten there uh, at a basketball game, their whole basketball team got in like an actual physical fist fight with the other basketball team. He's like, our whole basketball team is suspended. They got to miss the next five games. They're suspended from school. That's why we made them sit up there with you, hence the Giants next to me, right? That's why we made them all sit up there. We've separated them from all their friends. That's why. Their coach came up to me, and they're like, thank you so much. How did you know this happened? You must have read it in the paper. I was like, we've been over this. I don't read the paper, right? Like, I don't know. But it's, it's God in his mercy, he knows what's going on in the heart of people. And, and it's like a message comes to Jonah, and Jonah's like, it's terrifying. I can't do it, God. Anything but that, God. I'm afraid, God. What do you want me to do? But God is aware of all the ways that he is preparing the road even before Jonah gets there. Are you with me? God knows. He's like, no, man, the people are set up right now. And Jonah gets in a boat and tries to run away. And God is like, no, no, no. Like, we can't wait two years. You have to go now. And in his grace, he intervenes. In his grace, he intercepts. And he brings Jonah to the place where he needs to be. That's why the people repent so quickly. Even when it comes to the people of Nineveh, they worship this God called Ninu. And Ninu was literally a fish god. Their Philistine neighbors called this god Dagon, and if you see a picture of Dagon or you see some etchings on a cave wall, Dagon looks like a half man, half fish. The bottom part is fish, the top part is dude with a beard. And so you got to think, in this town, actually that's the name of the town, Ninua, that's what Nineveh means. So this is the city of the big fish. A guy gets vomited by a fish out onto the land And he comes to you and says, I have a message from God. That whole town is going to be like, yeah, you probably do. Like, we actually, we 100% believe you have a message from God. Ignore the blood of our enemies on the wall. Tell us the message that God has given you to tell us. And I don't want you to miss this, that Jonah is in that fish because of his rebellion. Jonah is in that fish because he ran from God. If I ask Jonah to tell me about his life, that fish is probably one of the most embarrassing things about his life. That fish is probably one of the parts of his life he doesn't want to tell you about because it's a time when he ran from God. It's a time when he knew what to do, but he rejected God's leadership and he did his own thing. He's humiliated. He is embarrassed. He is embarrassed by that season of his life. And that is the very thing that God uses to be a part of his message that brings transformation to this city. The most embarrassing part of his life, what he would call his biggest mistake, becomes a part of the message that God calls him to preach, and it helps that message actually goes further and faster and brings God's will in the city where Jonah has been sent. My friends, I don't know what has happened to you over the years. 
I don't know what you've done. I don't know all your stories. I know some of them. But I know my story. And I know there's a lot of things in my life that, that I might wish had gone differently, choices I wish I had made differently. There's a lot of stuff where I can feel as I come before the presence of the Lord that, that he could not love me, he could not extend grace to me because of the mistakes that I have made, and I know that many of you feel that way too. I don't know what you've done, I don't know where you've been, I don't know, but I want you to know this, that God is able to take every part of your life, to redeem it and use it for his glory, if you will walk with the recognition that he is your authority and he is the one that loves you more than anyone else could possibly love you. Your greatest pain can be your greatest platform for ministry, if you will Surrender to his will. Remember how messy, how messy it was. But God took that mess, that fish, stink-smelling, vomit mess, and he turned it into a part of Jonah's message that brought the glory of God to transform an entire city. Amen? So two things for us to take away from Jonah 3. This is what you pray over. This is what you think about. This is what you ask the Holy Spirit to convict you of and move in your heart about. First of all, don't believe for a second that God can't save somebody. Think about how terrible the people of Nineveh must have seemed to Jonah. No wonder he ran. Don't think for a second that God can't save somebody. Who have you written off? Who have you blown off? Who do you know that the Lord is telling you, you need to talk to that person. You need to bring that person to church. You need to tell that person about your faith. And you are like, not them, God, anybody but them. There's nobody that's so far gone that God cannot move in their life. Don't believe for a second that God can't save somebody. And secondly is this, don't believe for a second that God can't use somebody. The most unusable person here is Jonah. Jonah is running and he's angry. Jonah is bitter. He has rejected God's leadership and authority in his life. Last week we looked at Jonah is not praying. Jonah is not doing anything that a good prophet is called to do. And God uses Jonah. And I want you to imagine what God could do with your unreserved yes to his will and to his leadership, to his grace, to his goodness, to his power, and to his love for your city and the places where he sends you. As we pray today, ask those questions. God, where are you calling me to go? And others of you are going to ask the question, God, I am ready. I'm ready to come home. Show me your love and move in my life. Let's pray together.